Hello everybody, James here of WSI. Before I get to my very special guest, a couple of plugs. Uh, I've written two books, of course, Owen Hart, King of Pranks, and The Rock, The People's Champion. And my next guest actually features in both of these books. And I'm actually going to have to read this as well because there's so much to do in the intro, but here it goes. Former NWA champion, former WWF Intercontinental and Tag Team champion, former King of the Ring, UFC Superfight champion, UFC and Impact Hall of Famer, MMA legend, and still... The world's most dangerous man, Ken Shamrock. How the devil are you? I'm doing well, man. Thank you for having me on. I, and thank you for coming on as well. I can't. I, I nearly passed out. Like I, I didn't want to take a breath through that intro, but there's so much to get through. <laughs> well, it, yeah. Imagine what my body feels like. <laughs> <laughs> well, do, do you know what? Actually, that fantastically brings me into the first question. So you took a, a layoff. You got into pro wrestling again a few years ago. You had a bit of a run with Impact. And you stopped around uh, the beginning of 2021. And then a couple of months ago, you got back into the ring with Harry Smith. Uh, how did that feel, uh, you know, getting back in and after 18 months? How's the body holding up? It was good. Uh, that one there was kind of a short notice, um, you know. So being able to get back in there and really just go in and actually just do what I do, uh, it was comfortable. Um I, I, especially after I did it, it felt like, man, I felt like I could have done more. Unfortunately, you know, you go in there, you've got to work with what you've been given. And so um, we, we made it work, man. But uh, I, I've got other things that are in the future that um, hopefully um, will be able to shine a little bit more in a different way. So we look forward to that. Stay tuned. Yeah. Are we talking uh, pro wrestling? Are we talking MMA? Are we talking somewhere in between? What are we talking here? We're talking bare knuckle fighting, dude. Promoting or are you are you getting back in there? Yeah, promoting. Yeah, no, no. My days in the ring um, are uh, are going to be very selective and uh, in in different different venues. Um, but in this, this is my love. Something that I fell in love in the beginning, which was the bare knuckle aspect of mixed martial arts. Um, I loved it. Um, I feel like it's the purity and it's God-given talent. And it's something that I feel like two people getting in the ring, you don't need anything to make anybody better. You just go in with what you have been given or what you've been born with. So that's really my focus on really building something that continues to just be God-given talent. This is actually, this this Bad Knuckle FC that came about a few years ago as well. You were obviously... Uh one of the forerunners in, in the UFC when the gloves weren't mandatory. Do you think after 30 years in the business now of uh, shoot fighting or, and more, is have is wearing gloves more safe or less safe in the long run? Well, I, I don't think you could really put a finger on it as far as any proof. But from my aspect of taking uh, um, three or four different um, styles of fighting and been involved with it, for me, you're literally the aspect of putting a glove or tape on a hand is to what? Protect the hand. Nothing to do with protecting the head. You wear headgear for that, right? And that doesn't do it, right? So for me, I think that the Aspie idea of what they try to sell to the fans as far as protection when they first put a glove, an MMA glove on someone, it's like, we want to protect the fighters. Well, the reality of it is, they wanted to protect the guys that were winning. They didn't care about the guys getting knocked out. I mean, those guys aren't coming back, right? I mean, like, they want to protect the guys so that they can make it, especially when we were doing tournaments, that can make it to the next round and be healthy and fight. So that's why the gloves were implemented in the first place, not for the safety of a fighter's head, but for the safety of the fighter's hand. This was to pl placate John McCain, wasn't it? And, and, and the Crusaders against UFC and MMA fighting in general. Well, I'm not sure that was even it. I think we were starting to move in, the, in, a, in a better direction. I mean, obviously, I think visually, uh, it looked like they were protecting uh, and becoming more, I guess, organized or more of a fan base type thing. But the reality is that people got to understand, man, you know, that isn't what it is, and, and, and we're, we're talking about now, right? You're talking about putting tape on a hand, putting a four-ounce glove on top of that hand. So now what I've done is i protected this hand so that now I can hit you in the head a hundred times and not hurt my hand. You take all of that off, and every single boxer, if they're being truthful with you, or an MMA fighter, they're being truthful with you, 
If they tell you that you have to go out and fight bare knuckle, they're not going to want to. Not because they're afraid of getting hit in the head, because they're afraid that they're going to break their hand. That's the truth. What's your opinion on uh, fingerless gloves versus fingered gloves in certain other MMA uh, promotions? Are you more of a proponent of the fingerless, or does it sort of affect grappling in, in, in too much? Well, we go back to the original thing that I said with God-given talent, right? Well, it literally does take away the God-given talent when you actually cover a hand with a glove, whether it's fingers or whether it's not fingers. You take Look how many rear naked chokes, uh, how hard it is to sink in a rear naked choke now. Whereas back in the day, if somebody got your back, you know, you 75%, 80%, you were going to finish that fight. Now, once they put the glove on there, you're lucky it's 50-50 that you maybe even less than that. But it, it, it takes away the odds of your submission. Leg locks, where it's very, very important that you're able to be able to feel with your wrist to be able to hook an ankle, uh, be able to hook an Achilles. There's a lot of things that you have to do with your hand and feel with your hand that you don't get with the glove on. So it's taken away a lot of the submissions uh, as far as striking. And we talked about this. It's really taken away the purity and the accuracy of striking. Now you put a glove on anybody and we can make it a tough man contest where you can swing from the floor and then hit him in the head any way you want. And you get rewarded for it as opposed to, yeah, you may knock a guy out swinging from the floor, but you're not going to fight for six months or two for a year, however long it takes to heal that hand. So I, I truly believe that, you know, we need to be moving in a different direction and really start paying attention, not to what people are saying, but what the facts are. So gloves are essentially keeping up appearances, but the science doesn't quite back them up in that sense. It is. It's just appearances. Uh, it's satisfying athletic commissions, which to me, um, we need to re rethink and we look at that and start looking at what we believe and what we know scientifically and medically about what a glove does and what taping a hand does. It's to protect the hand, not the head. Absolutely. Uh, I want to pick up on something you said beforehand. You said you're going to be a lot more selective with your pro wrestling dates. And um, I'm going to bring up a few names to you. Billy Gunn, he's uh, your age, I believe, exactly. He's having possibly the biggest run of his life at 58. Steve Austin turned up at 57 to headline WrestleMania and did a really good job. There's Goldberg and Undertaker are a couple of years younger than you, and they've been huge parts of the business for decades. Sting's like five years older, and he's still uh, doing stuff as well. So uh, I'm sorry for slightly outing your age there. I don't know if you're offended by that. But <laughs> <laughs> but um, does that sort of give you the, I don't know if it's the confidence, or the, or you look at them and go, I could still do that. I've still got one big thing left in me, and like, what would that be if uh, if you could choose? Well, that's never been... Uh, a question for me for anybody whether or not I could still do it I mean physically uh, I have always looked the part and also been able to play the part um, I am definitely um, in really good shape and I always have been in really good shape and everybody knows it so uh, it, it, it's not my age it's not my uh, ability that's kept me away so um, I don't know what that is why that's kept me away but um, I'm always open always available um, but again, like I said, I'm not, I'm not somebody's puppet either. So it's got to make sense. Like anything that comes to me has to make sense. It's sort of like it's like an attainable goal. I don't know if it'd be WWE or maybe something in Japan. But what would sort of like your your main attainable goal in pro wrestling be now that you would like to get in and do it again? Well, I think a lot of things have to line up. You got to have the right opponent. Like, I'm not just going to go in and sign with an organization and do a, a a road tour with them. I mean, I'm just, that's just not me. I don't have the uh, the ability uh, with my schedule and the things that I have going on with the Valor Bare Knuckle League that I've started. Um, so I've got a lot of stuff that I'm, I'm committed to doing, but I don't mind going in and doing spots and, and, and ma that makes sense, um, which I've done several times uh, in the past year. Um, so yeah, those are fun for me, being able to get the right opponent, you know, uh, I've always said this guys like Kurt Angle, which I know, you know, God bless him. Uh, his body's broken down, but you know, if that was ever an option, you know, um, you, even the guys like Brock Lesnar, you know, who come from the same background I've done um, Bill Goldberg, who basically played the image of an MMA fighter. Um, so, and there's a lot of them out there, uh, you know, ones that should have happened. It didn't. So uh, again, like I said, if those kinds of things come my way, I would take a serious look at them because those make sense.
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this was a question further on down the script, but I think it's I'll bring it up now. Is maybe today who you've already told me who you'd love to face now? Maybe back in the late nineties and the WWF run, or maybe some guys in WCW at that time. Were there a few people out there that you just really wanted to have a singles match with that it just never quite happened? Well, uh, Kurt Angle, uh, obviously, I mentioned that already, and Brock Lesnar, and I mentioned that one. Um, Goldberg was another one. I mentioned that one. So those are really, if I was to look back, those are the only ones. Any of the other ones, um, you know, they're just great matchups because they are. But these literally have, these make sense because of the styles and the people they are. I also mentioned Steve Blackman um, in a, a lot of other my, uh, um, when they've asked me that, who in those times, and Steve Blackman was another great one, w- would have uh, been awesome to be able to run a program with him. Um, so those really, those are the ones that really made sense to me that didn't happen. I will ask you a couple of bits of news, a couple of MMA stuff, and then we're going to go from the pro wrestling career, sort of from the beginning and see how far we get, because I, I write a novel every single time I do research on somebody, so it's just how far I can get in it. Uh, but uh, the death of Antonio Inoki, um, that was a couple of weeks ago, as we, uh, a few weeks ago, I believe, as we record this now. You did wrestle for New Japan a couple of times. I don't know how much time you spent with Inoki, but I suppose what Inoki meant to you and MMA in general. Yeah, I think Inoki was a face for a lot of us young wrestlers coming up, um, especially from the United States, that was just a just this image of toughness and um, you know uncertainty, too, because you weren't ever near him enough. Um, but yeah, he was, he was, he was one of those icons that uh, a lot of young wrestlers looked up to, especially if you ever had a chance to go to Japan and actually work in their industry because it was different than ours. Um, so yeah, he was someone I looked up to someone I respected tremendously. Um, I had the, um, uh, the, uh, I guess I would say that to be lucky, I was able to actually work in new Japan, um, this last weekend, um, when they were in New York. Um, I got to face off with uh, Minoru Suzuki uh, in, in the uh, <laughs> inside the squared circle. So um, that you want to ask about, you know, matches or opportunities that uh, it didn't come up that probably should have come up somewhere down the road. That's another one in pro wrestling that with our style, uh, what we call hybrid uh, pro wrestling, um, where it's pretty much, you know, beat the crap out of one another and we'll see who stands at the end of it. Um, that's also another one that I love to happen and got to go face to face with him this last weekend. So we'll see where that goes. Yeah, definitely. Uh, just going back to Inoki briefly, did you ever find out what he thought about Pancras? I did, you know, usually when you were around him, you were more focused on what was in front of you and what you were doing. Um, he was always a guy that was straight to business. Uh, and he worked hard and he made sure that everybody else did also. So every time I was around him, we were working out, we were, we were moving, we were going. So, um, and that's what I really appreciated because it wasn't a whole lot of talk. It was more action. I, uh, did I pronounce that rightly? Because I always called it Pancrase and then I heard someone call it Pancras. How do you pronounce it? However you want, as long as you get it out. <laughs> Pancrase. <laughs> Pancrase for you. Okay. I'll say Pancrase and that's good enough for me. Yeah. Uh, MMA wise, a couple of bits of news that sort of, more general bits of news, but uh, one of the biggest ongoing stories of the last few years is John Jones has been refusing to fight for the UFC, still under contract. It's a big money issue. Uh, I'll give you a couple of numbers here. I think UFC pay about 80% of their revenue to the fighters. NFL's more around 50%. WWE. Say that. Wait a minute. Say, what, what was it? Sorry. Uh, UFC. The first part? The first part? Uh, uh, UFC pays something like 18% of their total revenue oh, per 18. year. 18. I thought you said 80. Oh. I thought you said 80. Oh, no, 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 no. Like... <laughs> No, I yeah, think, okay. I, I think it's about 18, NFL's 50. I think WWE's even less that are like in the teens, like maybe 11, 12, 13, somewhere around there. But what do you think, the as a fighter, of course, what's the sweet spot of how much should the fighters be paid? I, I couldn't tell you. I, I'm not. That's, that's way out of my league. Um, but I will say that there is a problem. There's no question there's a problem, obviously, because of everything that's going on and how – uh, a lot of people are responding and even I've been through it myself and I felt like there's just seems like there's just a disconnect here on, on that pay. Um, again, though, uh, to be fair to Dana and the UFC, uh, I don't have an understanding either about what they're bringing in, how much they're bringing in, what they're spending. 
So uh, until we really get to understand that, then we truly don't have a position to really, really be able to come at this fairly. And that's what I've always said is nothing against Dana or USC, but how do we negotiate as fighters if we truly don't understand what our role is and how much we're participating and how much they're making off of what we're doing for us to be able to negotiate from a, of a position of, of, an, an, a, a, of an equal advantage because UFC understands everything that's coming in, what they're making as opposed to a marquee fighter, not just a normal fighter, but a guy that is the face of the organization. How do you, how do you, how are you able to really negotiate a fair price if you don't understand all of the income that's coming in? And that's where I think the, the unfairness is, is that they're keeping that away and not letting anybody understand what that is, which is if you're hiring people and you're, and you're literally using them to make your money, then you have to include them on all of it. Are you, I take it you're a big proponent of a union in mixed martial arts and maybe even pro wrestling as well? I don't know. Uh, again, I don't know how the union works. I mean, I understand how it works outside in the job and all the other stuff. And I agree with some of the union and I disagree with some of the union because there's a lot of things that I don't understand why someone would get paid for whatever it is they're doing when they're not working, right? So there's a lot of those, that's like kind of going into a poll and voting and you got, you're going to vote for what you want, but there's 10 things listed underneath it. And you're like, well, yeah, but I don't like half those. Why do I have to vote for those? Why can't I just vote for this? That's the union, right? I mean, I agree with some of the things in the union, but I also disagree with some of the things in the union. Yeah, absolutely. I'm uh, going to move into one more MMA thing and it's, well, it's sort of uh, shoot fighting. So yesterday it was, I'm going to blow this now. It, it, was, it was one of the Paul brothers versus Anderson Silva. I can't remember which one. Jake Paul. There you go. Wrote it down. And I was wondering if you, because there's been a bit of a trend recently with Triller and Oscar De La Hoya these last few years, trying to get these sort of like legends bouts going in. First off, have you been offered a legends bout for uh, one of those two or somebody uh, higher up like that? No. Um, you know, I'm the wild card. Uh, I have the ability to beat any of them. Um, and uh, as people can see in my fitness and how good of a shape I'm in. And uh, so they're not going to come after somebody that has a potential to beat them. So they're going to go after guys that they believe have aged very well <laughs> in a bad way. And then they're going to fight them, which is smart. Don't get me wrong. I understand it, man. You, you got a guy coming in there that had, hadn't climbed up the ranks, hadn't fought, you know, you know, the elite of the elite to get to where they're at. They're, they're handpicking their opponents. Um, it's smart because that's all anybody's talking about. So you don't fault him for it. I think it's genius. What do you think the long-term effects are going to be for boxing? Is it, is it going to continue down the route of these sort of almost like celebrity fights or where, where do you think it's going to go in maybe five years? I think Balor Bare Knuckle uh, is what's coming because I truly, I believe this. Um, People want to see combat, com, combative fights. They want to see ranked fighters. They want to see professional fighters. And um, so it's fun to have these things on the side. I mean, millions of people are talking about it, social media is talking about it, so it's great to have that. But the fans also want that other thing, too, where they know they're going to see a, you know, two guys who are literally went through the ranks to get to where they're at, and you got two of the best in the world fighting one another. I mean, that's got to go, too, right? And I think that we have to transition from – the softness of boxing boxing is soft because you're wearing a boxing glove um and you're you're basically doing the same thing you've done for 200 years things are changing you take the glove off the boxer which is what we're doing take the glove off the boxer take the tape off the boxer and now you go in there and you still do the same thing that boxers are doing same rule sets other than we don't have clinching which is the most boring thing in boxing no clinching so where we go there's no clinching it makes the fights faster. Visually, it's exciting because there's blood, there's cuts. But long term, it's safer. You're not taking all the damage you would with a glove on. So I truly believe that, you know, every 20 years, 30 years, um, sports change. And they, they change the rules to try to make it more exciting and more up to date with what's going on in the world. I don't think boxing has done that. But I think that that's what Valor Bare Knuckle is going to do. We're going to take the gloves off because now when you do that, it competes with MMA. It's just as vicious as MMA. So now you've got a competition with Valor Bare Knuckle or Bare Knuckle Boxing 
with MMA and anybody stepping into the either one of these circles can win. You don't have to have 100 years in boxing to win in bare knuckle because you can go in as an MMA fighter because of the difference of the gloves and the size of the gloves. You're not able to block like a boxer. You can't sit in the pocket. You got to use more footwork. You have more accurate. And boxers, you're used to taping their hands. So now they got to get used to not. So I think that now you have this new thing coming out like we did in the UFC days where no holes barge came out and they were fighting in the cage. It was exciting. It was new. I believe that's what bare knuckle is right now. It's something new and people are going to start gravitating towards it because it's fast. Yeah, absolutely. I am going to move on a bit now. And I, for the life of me, I couldn't find the quote and I really wish I could. It may have been Gabriel Gonzaga, but it was someone uh, in MMA who said that they had grappled or sparred with every big uh, major heavyweight from Brock Lesnar to everybody else. And he said that you were stronger than Brock. You were the strongest person he ever grappled with. I hope it's the right person I've just said there. Having said that, um, how much could you lift in your absolute prime? What were the biggest benches, squats, deadlifts? I did 605 and I weighed 227 pounds in a bench press. I benched, I mean, I squatted 560. I deadlifted 700 pounds. So, uh, and it's just all talk. Like, you know, I'm just telling you, so no one has to take what I'm saying uh, for true. But you talk to people down in uh, Mooresville, North Carolina, where I was working at Adam's Gym down there in pro wrestling. That's where I did the bench press. Um, they'll tell you, you know. So um, I've, uh, I've, I've been gifted with strength. That's what helped me through a lot of my earlier in my career before I knew a whole lot of technique. Strength is what got me through, and I was able to dominate just on strength. And then came my technique. As I got older, I, I lost the strength, no question. Uh, my strength went away uh, because of, uh, you know, the shoulder. I blew out a shoulder. I blew out a knee. Um, those things, when those things happen, you know, that strength deteriorates. And so a lot of people in the end of my career, if I was saying this, would say, man, he wasn't that strong. Well, of course not. I was 52 years old or 51 years old or 46 years old. Uh, with injuries on top of it. So um, you weren't able to judge that properly. But uh, I even worked out with one of Tyson's um, mitt guys. And um, he told me the same thing that in every one of my punches, whether it was a jab, a right hand, a hook, an uppercut, I had power in both hands and some of the, and even as equivalent as Mike Tyson. Uh, could you give me a maybe a typical workout of like maybe time, reps, that kind of thing? How would you like really tap the gym if you're going to have a proper gym day? I'm sorry? Uh, so how are you going to like really attack the gym? If it, was a, if it was an absolute gym day, all strength, what would a typical gym workout be for you? For strength only, if I was just going in just to try to get a strength workout in, Absolutely. it would be five. It would actually start out as a warm up, doing anywhere from 10 to 12 with lightweight. And then I'd drop it down to five and I would do a ladder where we go five, four, three, two, one, and then one, two, three, four, and five back up again with actually decreasing the heavyweight from the one, uh, actually starting at five and then going heavier, 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 all the way up to one. And then staying with that one, doing it one time. And then the next time, each time taking off 10 pounds and doing two. Do you, uh, like these days, do you just do like three, you know, 10 sets of 10 German volume or something like that, where it's just a lot easier on your body, that kind of thing? How do you, how's your workout changed over the years? Yeah, now it's definitely all uh, high reps, uh, maintenance, nothing heavy. Uh, for me, it's just can, maintaining what I already have. Now, obviously, if I go into a training camp or something like that, where I'm going in and I'm going to do a pro wrestling thing. I would increase my weight. I would start putting on a little bit more size uh, at the same time, increasing my conditioning. So it, it all changes depending on what I'm doing. But right now, as we sit where I've got nothing really planned, all I'm doing is maintaining what I have. And that's just doing reps. Absolutely. We're going to go on to the pro wrestling career here, if I can say it. Um, and we're going to start from the beginning. And you got trained by, as far as I can tell, uh, Nelson Royal as well, but Buzz Sawyer and Gene Anderson, two of the toughest dudes in wrestling at that time. Now, Buzz Sawyer specifically, as far as a trainer goes, uh, I don't know if you've heard the story, but The Undertaker has told the story where basically he took the money and then he packed up and moved home and just left. Uh, was, it, <laughs> was it a fairly similar story for you? I mean, uh, how much did you actually learn from Buzz? Nothing. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, 
I already learned, I already knew how to wrestle uh, as far as collegiate. And uh, Buzz was a tremendous collegiate wrestler. Um, uh, me and him went head to head um, in a collegiate wrestling match. And I, I basically dominated him, which is not easy to do. He's tough. Uh, but because I was younger and he was a little bit older, I was able to get the best of him. Well, once he saw that, um, he started doing these tryouts, you know, every weekend he would have me come up there and I would show me a few things, which wasn't much at all. And they had these guys come in and they paid $1,500 to do a tryout. And he would come over to me and say, I don't want him to pass. So just work them until they quit. So I go in and beat all these guys up and he would kick me down a few dollars. And then I would go back the next week and same thing. And then if he wanted somebody to pass, I didn't understand it until later on, obviously, but there was some big dudes in there that looked really good and that had some ability football players. And I would beat the crap. I just said, I don't want him to pass. I said, okay. Now I go and I beat him up. And, but then he had this guy that worked as a plumber who was like 180 pounds. So yeah, I want him to, he, he could pass. So I would go in and I'd go easy on him. And as I found out later on down the road was he owned his own business. So he was able to keep making money from these guys that actually had their own business or at least had money. And so these guys would pass and then he would charge them a monthly fee to go to a gym and ride the bike and then go into a ring and learn how to take bumps and not really send them anywhere. Um, so that was, so I caught on obviously years down the road of what was going on with that, but that's basically how Buzz in the later part of his years was really uh, conducting business. Uh, did you drop $1,500 on the training as well? Not with Buzz. I didn't No, Um, I came up actually as a tryout and, I remember working out with him and, and wrestling with him and uh, he was really, really strong and a really good. But like I said, as older, I was able to wear him out and then dominate him. So I think that what he was doing is really looking for someone that it would kind of this idea of his that he had was being able to bring people in, beat him up and then make him quit. Not just because he could do it himself with most of them because he was that tough, um, but he wanted somebody else to do it. So I think he was just looking for that person and he found me. The hitman. So you were the hitman, yes. basically. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how many people know this, and I only found this out this morning, is that you had a tryout with the WWF in 1989, or you did a dart match anyway. Do you remember where it was, and do you remember who it was with? I believe it was in Winston-Salem, I think, and it was against Barry Horowitz, I believe. I've got I've got Barry Horowitz, and I've got Greensboro, North Carolina. That. Is that yes. right? Is that right? Yes. Yes. So yes. How, how did you end up getting the call for that? Who recommended you? Well, I was in the, uh, um, uh, with, um, Nelson Royal at the time and they were coming through and they were looking for guys. And, um, I was at the, I think at the time I was their champion. Um, it wasn't long, six months or so I was carrying the strap. So I had, I picked it up really fast. And uh, so Nelson put the strap on me. And then of course, when WWF came around, they wanted to build their guys up. So, um, he sent me along with, he sent me to Japan too, uh, from that, when I worked with, uh, the Japan wrestling company, I went over there under Nelson Royal. So I got a lot of opportunity because, uh, I think Nelson saw the ability that I had early on and was really pushing me. So, uh, I don't know if you remember anything specific from the match, but do you remember maybe who was the agent for the match? If there even was one, did you speak to any of the other people there? Any other memories? I don't remember. All I remember is walking into the locker room. There was Ultimate Warrior and uh, Arn Anderson and a few other people, I believe. And I remember walking. I didn't have any experience of what it was like there. And, and Ultimate went out to the ring because it was a, a house match. So he went on like second, third or fourth or something like that. He runs into the ring like he normally does. He shakes the robes, crushes somebody and runs back to the locker room. And so as I'm walking in there, I'm walking to the locker room. He just got done with his match. He's sitting on a stool. He's bending over, unlacing his shoes. And he literally passed out and fell on the floor. <laughs> and I was like, and nobody did anything. They were all walking around him. Like, just literally, like, it was like a, every day, right? And I was like, hey, dude, this dude, he's dying. Something's wrong with him. And I was like, I remember Orange just kind of laughing. He'll be all right. <laughs> I was like, all right. That's <laughs> That's like, no, so he just looked at him and said, Okay, it just sort of walked yeah. off then. <laughs> now I'm like, dude, this is crazy. You're like, of course I know now, right? It's like a guy, he went in and blew himself up, and then instead of letting him come down, he bent over and tried to do something, and he just lost himself. And it wasn't the first time it happened to him, obviously, because everybody kind of figured it was happening. I was like, well, okay, I guess you guys would know best. <laughs> <laughs> was this match, sort of, was this just like a, this wasn't a tryout match then? It was just you were a body to fill in the Philip card then. 
you know, just like Vince, I think Vince was always looking for talent, but when you come in, you're going to do a job like, but uh, when I came in there, I went under as Vince Torelli and, and uh, I went in and did it, but I didn't just do one. I came back and I did two more after that. So um, obviously they saw something cause they kept bringing me back. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you go to obviously first, uh, let's say obviously uh, these, uh, a couple of independent promotions, Atlantic coast wrestling, and then South Atlantic pro wrestling. And I believe Robert Fuller was the booker for that. Now, everybody who's ever met Robert Fuller, I mean, the foghorn leghorn of wrestling, uh, you must have a good story about Robert. Yeah, but not one I could tell on TV. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, it could be one of two things there, so maybe we should move on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> love the guy, though. I love him. He was He's awesome. I love the guy. Oh, we're hoping to... Uh, I've, I've, uh, I don't know if you know who Dutch Mantel is. I've got a podcast with him as well, so we're hoping to have Robert on as a guest. So he's, uh, he's one of the dream guests always. Uh, I'll move on from that then. Tell me if you're sick of talking about the Nasty Boys situation, then we'll move on from that. Yeah, I that mean, that's something that happened. You know, um, you look back on it with cooler heads. I'm, I can say this, that I am very, very, very glad that I never had the opportunity to get my revenge because I think out of everything in my life, that was the one that would have put me in prison because I was – because of the way it happened, not that I got beat up, not that I got jumped and whatever happened, I don't know. I can't, I can't be sure. Uh, but I don't, I do know who I am. Right. And I know I am as being a tough guy and I know I am as taking a punch. So I understand um, their fear because I went to them. It was my fault for running to their room uh, and trying to get after them. So the problem I had was what they did after they put me down. Mm. That's the problem I have. And that's what carried with me for so long. Wasn't that I took a beating because I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big man. I, I can take a beating. I'm okay. You know, it was the way that it was done and what had happened afterwards and the thoughts that went in afterwards that to me, put me in a position to where I wanted to, to put them in a grave. I wanted to beat them silly. And so I could literally says, I'm sitting here right now. God was looking after me because if I would have got a hold of them, uh, four years, five years, six years after that, those guys would not, not them guys, but one particular guy would not be walking today. Now, uh, I believe the uh, postscript to that is you bumped into one of them, one of the nasty boys or both of them on an airplane. Is that right? No, it was uh, one of them. Uh, both of them were there, but there was one of them that I particularly was going after. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, it's the same story I told over and over again. I got in his face. I, I'm, I'm not a stupid guy either. I don't want to go to jail or prison because um, we were in an airport and uh, there's cameras everywhere. You know, I mean, there's no way that I was going to get away with it. And I was just starting in the WWF. I didn't want to ruin my chances there, but I wanted to give him an opportunity. <laughs> I want to give him the opportunity to see whether or not he had the balls enough to stand up to me. And, uh, and I jumped in his face and it was quite obvious to everybody there that he wanted no part of me, absolutely no part of me. And he made a comment that if uh, I hit him, it was a federal offense. And in that particular moment, I was like, because everybody heard, everybody watched, everybody saw, it felt like it was enough for me to really put him in his place, that everything that he was saying about how he was able to kick my ass and that he could do it again, literally squashed any thought of whether or not he was going to step up and, and take and take take responsibility for what he was saying. Come on, because I'm here. Let's see what happens. Um, he fled. And for me, right at that point in time, that was the only thing that really gave me the ability to be able to let go a little bit. Yeah. Um, because we sort of jumped into it. I mean, uh, stop me if I'm wrong. I'll do like one or two sentences and then we'll move on because I know you've told the story a million times. But essentially, you went to the Nasty Boys hotel room after some sort of kerfuffle in a nightclub uh one was asleep on the bed the other one attacked you with a phone or something and basically it was a two-on-one uh beating uh, essentially uh far beyond what it should have been or you know far beyond what anything should be in that case uh, am i about right there yes i felt like they took it to a point to where they had no i mean obviously we work together they may like me not like me whatever it is but where they took it to, they almost basically took my life um, over 
over a fight, over get going into a fight. To me, I just that's hard for me because I can fight with my brother, I can fight with a friend, I can fight with somebody I don't like. But if you try to kill me, or if you try to put me in a position where you're going to take away an ability for me to make a living in my life or my family, that's where I draw. That's where I drew the line. Is like, okay, you, 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 you put me in this position, and now I'm going to come back and I'm going to put you in the position I was in. Absolutely. Um, I'm. Do you know what? There was one more question. I was almost going to skip them, but I actually will ask it. Is do you remember the first time anybody tried to shoot on you in a pro wrestling match? Nobody, nobody, nobody ever tried to shoot on me. And if they said they did, <laughs> they're just trying to play their game, man. And that's ridiculous. Come on. I fought the best in the world. I was champion in Japan. I was champion in the U.S. at the same time in mixed martial arts and no holes barred. So, um, yeah, <laughs> it's like, let them talk. Yeah. I, I wasn't actually quoting anyone there. That was a complete guess on my part, just to see if someone actually was stupid enough to do it. No, no, <laughs> no, not not to my... Now, people always said that that Vader, um, you know, that he cold-cocked me, like when I went down that one time, and I was like, I was like, uh, no, uh, I, I mean, I think that uh, I would know that, and if it did happen, it would, you know, things would have been differently. And I also told him, just look at the match when I hit the ground. Watch how I position myself after I hit the ground away from the ropes so that yeah. Vader's able to come around and do the next move. <laughs> <laughs> that might that match might actually come up in a later question then. Uh, uh, we're going to go to, obviously, I, I talk about UFC all day. I love UFC. I love MMA as well, but we're going to stick to pro wrestling. You leave MMA or you make the decision to leave MMA around late 1996, I believe. The bottom's fallen out of the business after a few good years. Uh, as I say, politicians are after it to try and ban it all together. Why did you end up going to the WWF instead of WCW? Did WCW make any overtures towards you? No. Uh, you know, I, I we definitely put the, the feelers out. Um, there, was, uh, there was definitely interest in, in everyone, but no one really, like Vince, just shut the door. I mean, like he talked, he came to me personally, like got on the phone with me personally, brought me in immediately. So it didn't give anybody else an opportunity to really even get a chance to come up, uh, give make an offer for me. So I was in his uh, down in the, in the office down there uh, within a week. Um, I was already in front of Vince and Vince was already making me an offer. They were all, they're already showing me what they wanted to do. I mean, they made it, they made it so when I walked away from there that I had already made a deal with them and there was no way, no way anybody else was going to be able to bring me in. Did you uh did you get the full tour of the Vince McMahon mansion? Um no. I, I I got in the office. Basically, they showed me outfits. I mean, they had they had it down. Like I, I mean, I was like, that was some fast work, right? Uh, but when I left there, I got a sweet deal. I mean, a really, really sweet deal. More money than I'd made in the UFC. Um, you know, so it was it was one that um I don't think anybody could have said no to. An offer an offer you couldn't refuse, essentially. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. yeah. Do you know, actually, uh, with the first meeting with Vince McMahon, um, you have said good guaranteed money because they were starting to do guaranteed contracts by this point or downside, uh, you know, uh, downside guarantees. Were there any other guarantees he made to you, like you'd have a certain run with a belt or uh, you'd get a certain amount of royalties? Were there any other promises he'd made to you? Yeah, you know, those are things that um, Vince and myself and also the people in that room were talking about. Obviously, I'm not going to go out and talk about those things because they that's just not respectful. They haven't done that to me and I haven't done it to them. Those are things that's just business. But I can just say this, that it was fair. I felt like I was important, uh, that they were serious about what they were going to do with my character. And so when I walked away from there, I felt really comfortable signing with them. Uh, who would you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis more? Would it be like Bruce Pritchard or Jim Ross, or who would it be? Both. Jim Ross, Bruce Pritchard. Um, uh, JR was always a strong role model for me. Um, he always kept me on point. Uh, when I screwed up at one time, he pulled me aside and said, Kenny, this is not you, you know? Um, so he was always really a good role model for me. We shall move on. Who? What am I going to ask next? I've got so many questions for you. Um, when did you hook up with Bret Hart? Uh, because I believe you went to his house, didn't you, in Calgary? Yeah, that was before I actually went in and started, um, you know, working with W. After we went down, we we put something together. 
then I went down to Brett, started working with him for a match that I was going to have. Um, um, and so when I went down there, I stayed, I, I couldn't remember a month, six weeks, something like that. And got to work out, got to be at Stu's birthday party, Sue Hart's. Um, and so for me, it was really, it be, especially since, you know, I wasn't really into pro wrestling at the time and I started getting educated and, you know, didn't realize, you know, how important it was that I was there and being able to be in what we, you know, the Stu Hart and the Bret Hart dungeon, you know, being able to be a part of that whole training process up there. Um, there's a lot of history there. And so um, I really didn't understand it until later down the road, how important that was for me. Stu must have loved you. Yeah. Yeah. He loved me enough to put me in all kinds of different submission holes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Do you do a yeah. do you do a stew impression? No, I don't. I'm not good. I don't. I'm not good at impressions. Yeah. I just know that Stu was a straight up guy. Really loved him. Um, he was a uh, he was a wrestler's wrestler. You know, old school. Um, and tell you like it is. You never had to worry about what he was thinking because he's just going to tell you. With um with studying up with uh, Brett because uh, did you have to tell him beforehand? Hey, I, I was in, I was actually a pro wrestler for quite a few years, you know. And then or or were you like your mind was open to learning completely from the beginning because you knew you you were going essentially into the big time WWF. I forgot that I wrestled. I really did. <laughs> I never brought it up. I seriously never brought it up to anybody because I went as Ben Sterelli, so no one knew for a while. And so I never came, I never even thought about it. I mean, think about the career I had in, in MMA. I mean, that's all that was on my mind. So when I went into pro wrestling with, with WWF, it was like, oh, okay, let's, we're going to try this. But it wasn't in my mind to go, oh, I'm going to tell these guys I wrestled before because I didn't think it was necessary. I thought people would probably already know, right? But I, what I didn't realize was I went as Vince Torelli. <laughs> so it, it was different, right? So it wasn't until about a year or so into it that, Someone had said, hey, you used to be Vince Torelli. And I was like, yeah. And then it kind of dawned on me, well, yeah, that's probably why nobody really knew. Um, but it really, to me, it was more about, I was in a moment. And so I was looking more towards how could I be better and how could I catch up to everybody because these guys were pros and I was green. And I was going into this at the highest level and I had to be better. And so that's all I was thinking. What specifically did Brett teach you? Anything that sticks out in your mind or any advice that he gave you to sort of survive what was probably a bit of a snake pit of a locker room at that time as well? Well, what he told me, it, it sunk in, and it's really how I went about my business, was he said, don't be a pro wrestler. And I was like, I was like okay. <laughs> what do you mean? He goes, you got to be you. He says, whatever you do in that fight cage, you got to do in pro wrestling, but do it like you were sparring, not trying to hurt anybody. Just go in there and just do the things you would do when you're practicing moves or you're going in there and sparring and trying to get a, a, com a punch combination down or a submission combination down that you're not literally trying to tap a guy out, but you're going through all the processes and the moves to do it. And he said, anything that anybody does to you that's a pro wrestling move, counter it with a submission move that you do. And I was like, that's easy. Like, that's literally why it was so easy. Because anything that anybody ever did to me, I counted it with what I knew how to do, which was in the world of true fighting. Did you find uh, the longer you're with the WWF, more people trying to tell you to do things the pro wrestling way? Yeah, there was a few times where I got into some matches where guys were calling spots for me. And I literally had to tell them, I don't do that. And that was, that was advice by Brett. So JR told me the same thing, right? And Vince did too. Vince told me, you got to be, just be your character, be you. We want you, the world's most dangerous man. So I was getting it from everyone that was in power. Um, so I was able to have a little bit of confidence to really tell people I don't do that. Like, but I can do this. Like, if you do this, I can do this. And a lot of them were very, very hesitant at first because they didn't understand what I was going to do. And I literally told them, don't worry about it because I'll just do it. You can't stop me from doing it, right? I'll just do it. You count, you do something, I'll counter it. And you just do what you feel you want to do at that point in time. And I'll get there. And that's really what it was, is I just forced moves. I got into moves. I didn't hurt anybody because I was able to do it like I was in, in training where guys were trying to stop me from doing it. But I was able to still do it without hurting them. That's what I did in the pro wrestling rings. I just literally went into moves and different things where they didn't understand it, but they didn't have to because I could get there whether they wanted me to or not. 
with um, as you were saying before, you, you would know how to get into things and out of things and everything. Your first big match, I know there was something with Vernon White where you have a bit of a sparring thing on Raw, but the first major yeah. matches, and you know what I'm going to say, Vader. How hard did you laugh when Vader started saying, ease up, ease up, <laughs> across the ring to get you to ease up? <laughs> um, I can honestly tell you I didn't hear him. <laughs> Uh, I I did I I I uh, I didn't I thought after the match was over I thought that you know it was horrible I felt like man I just because I it just didn't feel right to me right and and uh, and I remember Vader came back and he said man heck of a match everybody came up said man you guys kicked the hell out of one another and I was like and it was like it was over like people thought that was my first match they're like dude that was unbelievable. But they also thought Vader got his ass handed to him, too, and that Vader hit me with a hard shot trying to give me a receipt. Maybe he was. I don't know. I've heard he did or he didn't. But to me, I rolled with it. It was like I didn't think that. Like, I didn't think, like, he was trying to send me anything. I just felt like that was normal. But, of course, I sparred my whole life, and I'm, I know how to be able to roll with those things. And the fact is, I told people, you know, swing it. I'll protect myself. Don't worry about it. Um, and so that's how I did the wrestling was, is I just, I didn't want to be a pro wrestler. I wanted to be an MMA fighter in pro wrestling. And so that's what I kept being preached to. And that's what I kept wanting to do. And so I ended up getting there, but the Vader, the Vader match to me, I thought when I, after it was over, I just felt like it just didn't feel like we did anything because I was used to something else. But as far as pro wrestling, it was a tremendous match. And um, I hear that all the time with people saying, man, Vader clocked you, man. He knocked you down, man. How did that feel? And I'm like, what? It's like, me and Vader got no problem. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> it's like, but it kept being asked. And I was like, I, and to this day, I still, I never really got a chance to really talk to Vader. It's like, brother, did you really try to hit me? It's like, cause I, I never really, but I didn't think so. I don't think Vader would do that. At least in my mind, I don't think so. Cause he knows if he does that, I want to tear him apart. But, uh, so I, and me and Vader were good. I've always loved the guy. Um, I thought we had a great match. Obviously I didn't when it was over cause I didn't understand it, but I think at that point it literally gave me a position of level setting of like, cause Brett did come to me and he said after man, he said, that was really good. He said, but you're going to have to ease up a little bit. If you're going to move, keep moving forward and work with everyone, we're going to have to teach you how to ease up a bit. And I was like, okay, no problem. That's the only time I had anybody ever tell me to ease up was Brett. Yeah, I, well, I was thinking, I mean, in my young mind when I was watching it, I probably watched it maybe a year or two afterwards, you know, I used to get the videos, I was a crazy fan, and uh, that one, that match always stood out, the head and shoulders above, that this was beyond what WWF was presenting. And I suppose in your mind, because you've wrestled for All Japan, UWF and Pancras and everything else, that it was just another pro wrestling match, and just the American fans were not used to seeing something that hard hitting. That That's, yeah... Because it's like, I think that you see a lot of that over, was or has seen a lot of that over in Japan where you have some guys that are snug. There's other ones that are a lot easier, but that was something that you would see in some matches. Like you just seen really crazy stuff. And to me, I just felt like it was just a match. I didn't, because I hadn't done it in a while, a long while, I felt like I just didn't feel like it was one of the better matches that I could have had. Right. But in the end, when I look at it now, it was awesome. It was really a great match. Yeah, oh, well, you got a fan in me from that match, let me tell you. Uh, I'm going to now do a bit of a game with you, and I call it Name Association. We're going to keep it to the WWF and people you work with, the WWF. I'm going to give you a sentence, and you just tell me the first name that fits that description that I give you. If there's a tiny little story with it, please feel fr uh, free to throw it in. And the first one is, funniest person in the locker room. Oh, got to be Owen. <sighs> got to be Owen. Did he get you? Oh, yeah. I mean, I've said this over and over. I was in one of these, you know how some of the uh, places you go, you try to open the door and they're just really difficult to open when you're in a locker room. A lot of times they're open, but this time I, I don't know who shut it, probably Owen, but door was closed and I was in there. I think I was in there by myself. It was a smaller locker room and I, Owen was in there and a couple other, they all walked out. Well, what I didn't realize is when I, when I was going to go out of the locker room, when they closed the door, he put Vaseline on the door handle. And so I couldn't open the door. It was literally my hands were all gooey. And I was like, what is that? Like, <laughs> I didn't want to touch it. So I, so I had to get a towel, dry everything off and open the door. But it wasn't easy because it was slippery. So 
Owen did a lot of other things, you know, um, that were, you know, funny. I really think that we lost a good one. Uh, one of the good guys in, in pro wrestling, always a genuine person, always kind hearted, always good to people, treated people well. So he was a good guy. Um, you know, I'll just stick with Owen briefly because I've written a book on Owen and I've studied his career, uh, I suppose, a bit more than most. Uh, amateur wrestling credentials, pretty yeah. darn good, quite frankly, as well. You wrestled Owen on the house show loop for maybe a month or two. I don't know how long it was. Did you guys ever just have like a playful amateur, you know, who's got the better technique, that kind of thing? You know, nothing that escalated, of course. No, I mean, there was a time where we did it, but it was more of Steve Blackman, Bradshaw. Um, I don't remember who else was there, but there was a few guys that kind of wanted to know what it is I could do. And um, so I was able to get in there. And then after it was over, Steve wanted me to teach him. Blackman wanted me to teach him. And so I started teaching him some things. Because, like I said, you got to remember, my skill set was the best in the world. There was nobody from Japan or the U.S. that could touch me, including Hoist Gracie. After the last fight we had, I beat, beat the stuffings out of him. And uh, so, you know, I was literally at the top of the world uh, in my game. So going into the pro wrestling, obviously, these guys have never really seen anything of this caliber, right? So um, I was able to go with a few of them. And when I did, they were definitely very um, eager to learn. Uh, next question is last man standing at the bar. <laughs> it, you, who are you talking about? Uh, uh, anyone from the WWF crew. So just all the WWF crew. Besides me. You can say yourself if, if you want to. Oh, there's, well, there's no doubt. I mean, like, <laughs> there's no doubt. I mean, anybody tells you that is out of their mind. It's like, <laughs> come on. That's like saying, hey, I can go in and knock Mike Tyson out. I could beat him in a, in a bar fight. Come on. <laughs> now, if it's everything goes, you know, obviously I win. But if you're talking about straight up stand up, give me a break. Come oh, on. No, no, no. Sorry. Uh, slight misunderstanding there. I mean, drinking wise, not fight wise. Oh, God. Uh, you said last man standing in a bar. That's the only thing I think of. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fight, brother. <laughs> uh, let's, let's, let's say the Jack and whoever else who's, uh, who can put it away better than everybody else. Yeah, no, I'm not even in the game, man. And I don't, I didn't hang around guys in the bar that much at that time. Uh, more personal, um, hanging around them, but I didn't hang out in clubs that much. So I wouldn't know. Okay. Uh, the most beautiful uh, woman worker, wrestler, valet, whatever it is, in real life. Oh, boy. I'm not going there, man, because <laughs> there's just a lot of, lot, a of, lot of good looking girls there. But man, yeah, there, there's, there's, there's different types, you know, thin, big, thick, skinny. I mean, they're all beautiful. <laughs> Fine answer. Wonderful answer. Uh, the most bullied or picked on? Bullied or picked on? I never saw that. Okay. The smelliest wrestler. Come on. That's easy. <laughs> That's Vader. Vader. Would you believe would you believe that I've had that answer before, Ken? <laughs> no, I would believe it, no question. <laughs> yeah. uh, your favorite travel partners? Oh, it has to be Road Dog and uh and Billy Gunn. No question. Yes. Great answers. Um most in trouble with the office. Road dog? That's a good answer. I think I think we've had that before. <laughs> Biggest pothead. Oh, come on. Big Papa. Yeah. Big Papa. <laughs> did, did you ever hear, right? So I've interviewed Godfather, and he said that the greatest roller of joints was Paul Bearer. That doesn't surprise me. Was, was he a big smoker <laughs> as well? Or just... That doesn't surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just wouldn't have picked him as a meticulous joint roller. Yeah, well, I've just seen, I've just seen a Godfather man. He was, he's, he was constantly chilling. <laughs> Good for it, oh, and he still is. He still is chill, yeah. ch chillest of dudes. Let me tell you, yeah. um, the nicest person in the wrestling business, uh, maybe even too nice. Yeah, man, the late Owen Hart. I would say, you know, great person, good guy. Yeah, yep, great answer. Um, the most memorable thing you saw happen on an aeroplane. 
Smiles creeping oh. up there. <laughs> Pass. Oh, dude. <laughs> oh, no. All Pass. Right. <laughs> okay, then. Uh, best and worst road agents. No, I, I wouldn't even know. Uh, that's something I ever really got deep into, so I wouldn't know. Okay. Um, biggest ladies, man. Just ask Papa. <laughs> there we go. Here's one that some people don't have an answer for, and some people do. The loudest spot caller. Oh, I I don't know. I wouldn't know. Okay. Uh, who is that? Who was it? You tell me who. Well, do you, who, do you know who said... what? I've heard a couple of names, but I think one was like Sid Vicious. He was loud. I think someone said John Cena, who I know was after your. See, time I now. never work. With the, I never work with those guys, so that's probably why. Yeah. Yeah. You can probably hear him from the back. Yeah, or Sid. Yeah, <laughs> I ne- but I never really. I have never really watched their matches, uh, Sid Vicious or them, so I never really saw them much. Okay, uh, we've probably got a few more then. Um, the, let's say the hardest deliverer of chair shots. Or weapon shots. Who really, really laid them in? Rock! Come on! <laughs> Did you have any ill effects from that at all? I called it. That was my spot. That's the way I wanted to take it. I told him that's what I wanted. I told him to swing it. And um, I felt like, you know, I've taken worse chair shots to the back of my head or to my head. And that's the reason why I did that one was because I hated him because I just didn't like not being able to see it. So I said, hit me in the face. I'll do the rest. And so he did that. And I, to this day, I can sit there as God is my witness, man. I hardly felt anything. The, the sound of it was, was more shocking than anything. But actually, the effects of it was nothing. Do you remember any other weapons that you took? Because like in the 90s, like tons of crazy weapons start coming into wrestling, like kendo sticks and whatever else. Do you remember any weapons where you just, you just couldn't work with it? It would just hurt no matter what. No, I worked with everything except for, but I can tell you the ones that felt the worst was the kendo stick. Mm. Yeah. Uh, was, was this, would you take it to the head or would this be on the back? Head was fine, but anytime it came into the back, it was always pinching your skin because of the way that the sticks would flex. It would catch your skin sometimes. Uh, I, and because I'm talking about chairs and stuff, who was, uh, I won't, who was most reticent to get hit with any kind of weapon whatsoever? Who's the most reckless? Uh, reticent. Who didn't like taking weapon shots? Uh, I would say probably Brett. Brett didn't. He was more of a solid wrestler. He didn't like all those gimmicks. Hmm. Fine answer. I uh, will give you a couple more. Okay. Uh, the most memorable botch that you ever saw. Yeah, it would have to be D'Lo and Draws. Uh, yeah, of course. That that was just that was that was fatal. It, it was it's hard to watch again too because you know Draws was such a great guy, and I know that Dilo was such a good dude, and how that had to have an effect on him. But that was the biggest from my uh, what I saw the biggest botch other than Owen Hart. But that was something that I think Owen, you know, when he hit the button, did to himself, and fortunately he didn't have the experience or the ability to be in that position in my opinion in the first place um so yeah then if you're talking about botches like that yeah those were just hor- horrifying yeah um i suppose just going back on dealer and draws because I, I hadn't remembered that you were in the arena for that day that would have been the very sort of last days you were with the wwf did you actually watch it as it happened were you watching the monitor yeah well no actually no i i um, that was i think i was I'm not positive, but I, I think I was actually preparing for a match. So I didn't actually get to see it. And I didn't even really get to hear about it until it was already done. Um, and then no one really knew because it's wrestling, right? You, you, you don't know if it's a work. Just like with the Owen thing, nobody knew for months that it was real until it was. So that was still another thing where it was like, hey, is, am, am, I, am I getting my legs being pulled here or something? So you really don't know until you know. Uh, when you see something like that, does it fundamentally change you as far as what you might be willing and maybe not willing to do in future matches? Or do you just sort of just tunnel vision and carry on as you were? You can, because if you do, then it's going to affect your ability to perform. Um, those things happen just like with anything, even in football, boxing, anything. People get hurt. 
and they get hurt and you go back out there and you have to do the same things over and over again because it's your job. That's what you're supposed to do. So you can't really let it affect you. You got to, and the hardest thing, even though it's, you got to do it, you got to, it has to be gone. It, it, you have to forget about it. And yeah. that's, that's the hardest thing is to just forget about it. But as a, as an athlete, you have to, you've got to move on. I'll ask you two more of the, uh, of these uh, favorite arena to work in. Ooh, um, I would have to say Madison Square Garden. Yeah, just because of the history of Madison Square Garden. Is Rose and Rose. don't get me don't get me wrong. Second was the Calgary Stampede. That that probably came pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. A lot of people say Rosemont Horizon. They really love Chicago as well in those days. Yes. Yeah. That that's good too. That one's yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. And the uh, final one, uh, and it d- doesn't have to involve you, uh, the most memorable backstage fight. Bret Hart, Vince McMahon, not much of a fight, but that because of the impact of it. I was, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, were you actually in the locker room when that happened, when that all went down? Yes, I was standing in there when Vince walked in with um, Pat Patterson and a few other people and me and Davey Boy and Owen and um, Nineheart, uh, we were all in there uh, when when that happened. Vince McMahon's uh, version of events is that he gave Brett a free shot. Is that what actually happened? I believe so. Um, <clears throat> only because Vince knew that if Brett hit him, that it would take away any opportunity of Brett being able to sue him. He leveled the playing field by Brett hitting him. If he Brett had to hit him, he could have sued him. Yeah. With um, can you? Uh, I'm, I'm sure you've uh, recounted this quite a few times as well. But can you sort of uh, take us back into the locker room that day? Vince and the entourage comes in. Shane McMahon, Sergeant Slaughter. What happens? How long does everything last? Oh, so if anybody tells you they were there, they're lying. Really? Because he made everybody leave. They made everybody leave. And that's another thing where there's no witnesses. So you didn't actually see the punch you you were told no. to leave and you walked out? We were we were told to leave. Yes. Did you wait outside the locker room and did you yes. see him limping out, that kind of thing? So, yes. Uh, so who told you what Clothes happened? Clothes torn, after? things ripped apart, hair sticking up, yeah. Oh, to be a fly on the wall for that event, I tell you. I mean, crikey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll move on then. And, uh, oh, for God's sake, the next question was the Montreal screw job. I'll uh, move on from that. Uh, actually, I won't. Uh, there is one more thing, is that uh, Bret Hart, after the fact, said, I will drop the WWF title to anybody. I'll drop it to the Brooklyn Baller. He named some other people. And then he says, I really wanted to drop it to Ken Shamrock. And was this something that Bret told you at the time, or was this something that you heard later on? No, Brett told me before this the screw job happened, um, he came to me and said that he wanted to do a program and he wanted to drop the strap to me. I didn't understand what was happening, all the stuff behind the scenes. Uh, and he didn't say either. Brett didn't say anything either. It was just like, this is what he was, was going to pitch to Vince. This is what we were going to do. And so I was pretty excited about the opportunity. Of course, you know, we all know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> I will move on, and this is something that I don't remember. I don't know if you're going to remember too much, uh, but early 1997, the head writer, one of the head writers, it was more of a uh, 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 booking uh, thing with a few other people, Bruce Pritchard, Jim Ross, Vince Russo. Did you prefer the writing or the direction of Jim Cornette or Vince Russo? Um, that's a, I don't think that's a fair question for me to answer because I didn't have an education or an understanding you know wh- what was happening or who was doing what so uh how much interaction would you have with vince russo uh, given tv tape oh, a lot a lot and i loved everything that he was doing i mean i did everything and um i appreciated everything that he was able to help me get done so there's no question but but i i didn't have anything against anyone i thought everything i was doing was working so i, I don't know who was actually behind it but I just know that uh, I felt really comfortable, especially in the beginning part of everything they were doing with me. 
Did you ever fully get comfortable with uh, reading lines from a script or were you only ever given bullet points and go out there and say this? Yeah, I wasn't much on 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 some of the stuff that they would train. I just wasn't comfortable. Like I didn't feel comfortable with trying to portray something else. So I just really be, because in the beginning it was just me, like just be you. And that's what I was doing and I was getting over and then later towards the end where they wanted me to start becoming other things is where it got uncomfortable for me. Uh, could you explain a bit more that uh, what they, they wanted you to become other things? What specifically? Yeah. Like when it was in the beginning, I was the world's most dangerous man. I came from the world of MMA and I was going in and doing things with Vader. And then of course I went and started doing things with other people. And then with the rock and, just felt like I was moving where I wanted to go and that character. And then they wanted me to turn heel. Um, they, and I was, I thought I was already a heel. I could be a baby face or a heel because I was me. So they started with that first. And it just, I just like, I didn't know how to do that. I was just me. And uh, I think that was the first uncomfortable thing was like, they're trying to make me be meaner. <laughs> and I was like, I'm already mean. <laughs> uh, did, he, did he mean like more in the face, just like scowl even more or constantly? I think it was more verbally, more like I'm a, I'm a jerk off type thing. Uh, I'm the baddest man in the world. I'll kick in more of a, of a gullible being cocky. And that's just not me. I even trying to act that way. I could pull it off. Hmm. Uh, how many times did Vince Russo call you bro? Was it in the millions? <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know, man. That was just his dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bro. Yo, bro. Uh, sorry, yeah. I can't do the accent. Uh, I will yeah. move on. And uh, it, it's something more of a bigger question with pro wrestling, I suppose. But how quickly does it take you to realize that you've got chemistry with somebody in the ring? Is it in the lockup? Is it five minutes into a match? Is it several matches down the line? How do you, when do you first realize that this is a great opponent for you? That never, I mean, everybody's different. Um, you could do it right away. Like me and Rock was right away. Other people, it may take one or two matches and then you click. So I think it, it's just everybody's different uh, depending on who you're working with, what, what kind of style they are. So, but I think with anyone, you can always get there. If you work hard enough, you can always get there. Uh, do you remember anybody as a wrestler that you maybe had no idea how they'd be and they completely surpassed your uh, expectations as far as how good they were? I would say rock uh, right in front of my eyes because I was working with him as he was transcending, you know? Um, and I think a lot of it had to do is the minute they, they brought him in and gave him the mic because he was with the nation for a while. Uh, when we started working, they just started to let him maybe open up a little bit. But as we were through the middle of our, our, you know, feud or whatever you want to call it program, he started to take off because he got comfortable on that mic. And once he did that, man, the star was the, you know, he, this, the stars were the limit. Did you ever have a word with Dwayne and say, listen, dude, I was the rock in UFC before you were the rock? No, I never, <laughs> I, I never came at him like that. But I, because when he started using the rock, I said, hey, bro, you, you know that I was the rock first, right? <laughs> and he was like, he looked at me very confused. And then I had a, I had a contract where I had all that carved out. <laughs> yeah. So I said, bro, no, seriously, I got it in my contract. <laughs> did you ever did you ever actually like trademark the rock for you as, as a nickname while you were in ufc i have it in a contract yes oh really oh yeah oh, in oh, yeah. in ufc or wwf contract U US, ufc not ufc and wwf in both of those i had it in a contract world's most dangerous man the can the rock shamrock lion's den all those things even the action figures that had lion's den written on them I own those. Those are mine. Those are my trademarks. So what do you think of when Pedro Hizo becomes The Rock in UFC? I, I don't know if there's a crossover where you both are becoming The Rock at the, in, in the same it, events or something. It, it don't matter. I mean, I, I just like when people talk about somebody copying my Kurt Angle, they're like, are you mad? I was like, why am I mad? It's like, that's like an honor. It's like someone uses something you've used and you've made it famous. Why are you upset about that? You need to come check this, bro. Oh, I think someone's ringing. Just one second, we'll pause. We're back. Sorry, Ken, carry on. Yeah, no, I just think when someone uses um, something that you've created, like The Rock, World's Most Dangerous Man, any of that stuff, 
unless they go out and they start trying to build a business with it, like literally a global business, and then tries to block you out from using it, that becomes a problem. But if you're both using, I, I don't care if someone goes in there like Kurt uses my move. It's like because someone else developed the slam way, way, way back in the day, but everybody uses it now. That is a compliment. <laughs> Definitely. Well, there was also, because uh, I used to do a podcast with Don Morocco, who was called The Rock back in the 80s. So, you know, there's there's always a, a rock beforehand, <laughs> yeah, isn't there? Right. Yeah. Uh, tell, me, tell me when you first started uh, feuding with Dwayne, who would be the ring general in that situation? Who would be the one calling the matches more? I think when we got started, we kind of we sat down with each other, tried to figure out what we both did well. And that we would try to put those different things in and add them in. But by, by, hey, listen, don't, don't even think about it twice. Uh, Rock was a genius when it came to wrestling and being able to, to put things together. So I followed him. Uh, so would you say that uh, this is going to come out wrong, but like the sort of balance of who would call the matches, would it become more the Rock later on down the line when you wrestled? Or did you always have a collaboration? Well, it was always a collaboration, but man, I leaned on him a lot to be able to make sure that whatever he was doing was going to get over. I have it here that you uh, are credited with making The Rock bleed first. You're the first person to make The Rock bleed. Is that true? Uh, Yeah, I don't know if it was that I actually did it, but I think it was just something that a move or something that we did where he took a pretty hard bump and uh, he you know, towards long or something like that. I think it was. Yeah, so, yeah, I think you're absolutely right there. Yeah. So it was. Did anyone ever come to you and um, Blade? Did anyone try and get you to do that? Cut yourself, or were you just not having that kind of thing? No, I, I think in those days uh, that wasn't the. Uh, that just didn't happen unless it was a gimmick that you used prior, or that it was something that was part of your thing. Um, nobody really did that stuff. You know, it was more about the action in the ring. And of, <clears throat> excuse me, I know the dozens and dozens of times you've wrestled him. Is there any one match with The Rock that really stands out above the rest? King of the Ring. Yeah, I thought King of the Ring was um, where it just felt like when we put that match on, we that, that our, our match was the match. Even with all the greats on there, I thought our match was right there. Yeah, that's the, that's the first one where you finally get the big win over The Rock as well. So, I mean... I, you raise your hands and you look so happy as well to finally get it done, you know, in front of the pay- uh, pay-per-view audience as well. So, I mean, that's probably, I would have, if I were you, I would have said the same one. But w- why that one over WrestleMania, let's say? Well, I just I just felt like everything we did in there was just spot on. It felt like the chemistry was on. I mean, it was always on, but this one just felt like it was like it. Like we, we put together a great match and we were competing with some great, great combinations. Um, and I felt like we were right there at the top. So, and so did everybody else when they when they watched the match or when they were there. A lot of people would have said, you know, hey, you guys were probably one of the best, or if not, right there with the best. Yeah. Uh, at WrestleMania 14, this is a few months earlier. Was there ever an original plan for you to win the Intercontinental Title Belt, or was it always going to be a more extended program as we saw? Yeah, I think the idea was, or at least I thought, I, I really did really, I, I was confused a lot with a lot, a lot of other people of why some things never happened because it felt like we were going that way. Uh, it wasn't like I didn't have the talent or the ability to do it. I think that I proved that already over and over again, but it just felt like it just died. Like it just felt like after Rock moved up for the title, it was almost like somebody or something was blocking me from getting my shot. Any theories on why that happened or? No, because like I said, I'd be guessing and I don't want to do that. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Um, we're going to go somewhere completely different now. And this has got a contract thing because uh, the theme about it. So you might not want to say too much. I understand. Uh, but your first piece of wrestling merchandise, do you remember getting your hands on your first piece of merchandise with your face on it, the figure or a t-shirt or whatever it was? Yeah, it was Toys R Us. Uh, I was shopping for one of my kids' birthday parties. And uh, the first time I ever saw it, I didn't realize it was there. And there it was. When my kid said, hey, and he's probably about eight years old at the time. He's like, hey, look at that. I was like, oh, my God, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> did you yeah, not have to do any? Hot. Sorry, uh, did, did you not have to do like any like photos or scans or anything like that? Or did it just turn up one day? 
I couldn't tell you. As far as I knew, it just showed up. And they may have. I don't know. <laughs> uh, as far as uh, T-shirts, figures, the computer games, maybe something else, what did you find to be the most lucrative line for you? Um, I, I it, it, Because it's hard to tell because your, your royalties come in uh, all – in one so you're breaking them down on what's selling what not selling was something that somebody else did so i would be able to go oh that one was the best or that one was the best because it came in all under one check so but i can tell you this it was it was substantial and it was like christmas balls and uh, uh race cars and you know i mean i had i was on everything like i was put right up there with the top guys and so it was it was impressive to say the least especially when you come from where I've come from, where there was no royalties, it was straight fighting and you sold your own T-shirts and, you know, that kind of stuff. So then to jump in that kind of a mega monster uh, business, it was overwhelming. Uh, because you mentioned like cars and Christmas baubles and stuff, what's the weirdest piece of merch that your face has turned up on? Uh, yeah, um, I would have to say, and it's probably worse, but um, not to not I didn't have to experience it, but I would have to say women's underwear. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> on 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 the crotch. Yes. <laughs> God. What face were you doing? We do we winking it on it a, or something? Or? It was a shamrock slam. <laughs> <laughs> were they a big seller? <laughs> uh, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> I did <laughs> I did not get there. I did not get there. And I, you know, I've also under, understand this. I did not put this out and I did not um, cl clear it either, but they did it anyways. It was a porn, which was also had my name on it. Yes, you realize you've got to the, tell me the story. I don't know this. There's a, you realize there's also a porn shop in Vegas called Lions Den. <laughs> ah. <laughs> so yes. <laughs> and how did your face end up on one of these uh, gentlemen's literature or or DVDs or videos or whatever? It always does when you become a, a famous person. They end up in all kinds of different situations. Um, you know, e even on uh, some gay magazines, there was, yeah, my my videos showed up on there in my speedos. So again, a lot of weird stuff. But you know, what do you do? You you send out lawyers and you try to make sure that you stop those from happening. But when you get famous, man, that's just the way it is. You gotta you have to deal with those things. Yeah, do you know what? I've heard this before, and it's probably true. When the porn industry starts to take note of you, that's when you know you've made it. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but it's definitely when you start noticing you need to, to, to start fixing things. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> no, we're not going there. <laughs> we should move on. And one of the most famous matches, or at least in my mind there is, uh, you have a main event on Raw with Stone Cold Steve Austin. And even as a kid, I remember thinking, that the match was arranged almost completely backwards because it seemed like you were wrestling as the babyface and Steve Austin was wrestling as the heel. And it was like a complete switch up, but it was such an interesting match. Uh, can you talk about like working with Steve in general and particularly putting that match together? Well, it's human nature, right? When you, when you go um, with people and well, even like when you see somebody that's an undefeated football team, they want to see you lose. And I think that with me at that time, the, the human psychology is like, I'm just that much better than Stone Cold. And I'm just, I'm beating him up and he's weak and he's begging and all that other stuff. And then pretty soon, because I am so dominant and cocky, like the heel they were trying to make me, which is hard, was hard for me. Uh, not as a fighter, because I did that naturally, but even as, as talking about it, right? So it just became natural that I was the dominant person. And I was so they almost I wanted the underdog to win. And that's how we built that match was for Stone Cold to be the underdog, but eventually come out on top. With Austin, and I think he's admitted this many times, is that he was very, very protective of his spot. He was very protective of his, of his position because it took him so long to scratch and claw his way to the top. Is that something you found working with him that maybe he was a bit more defensive than other guys? Not with me. Um, I, I felt he felt real comfortable with me. I felt like he was already in a position uh, at that point where his his role was he was the guy, period. And uh, me going in there, obviously, he had a tremendous amount of respect for me. And I think in his own mind was like it was an honor for him to wrestle me in this stage because of who I was. It was a feather in his cap, per se. 
So when we went in there and did that, we had a tremendous amount of respect for each other. And I had a tremendous amount of respect for him on what he was able to do with pro wrestling. So for me to be in there with him, I was like, okay, this is awesome. This is great. But I think in reverse, it was the same with him being in there with me, being the original world's most dangerous man and legitimate world's most dangerous man being able to work with me. With uh, Austin, there's a famous story where he was so energetic in a match with Kurt Angle that he actually blew Kurt Angle up. It's the only time it's ever happened in Kurt's career. When you wrestled Steve, we were just like, God, he's like a buzzsaw. He never, ever stops. I mean, it, it must have been a different, different to a you lot of people. you got to remember, man, I, I was one of the most conditioned MMA fighters. I went 46 minutes mm -hmm. with Fanaki. I went 36 minutes with Hoist. So blowing me up wasn't going to happen, right? <laughs> And uh, but maybe in his mind, he wanted to see. But there was at no point in time where I was ever in, uh, blown up, especially, you know, working pro wrestling, because remember, I went I mean, I was uh, it's a little bit different when you're going full speed with somebody trying to hurt you as opposed to working together. So for me, I don't think in his mind that was something that he was trying to do. I think it was just more of a respect for one another that I knew what he had done. He knows what I have done. I'm in his world and I'm going to learn from him. Uh, and speaking of Steve Austin, so you get into the WWF early 97. Um, were you the type of guy who, well, let's say you're on the road already, you're in the locker room. Are you the type of guy who would go to one of the more established stars like Undertaker or Brett or Sean or later on Steve and ask advice? Or were you not like an advice asker kind of guy and you just sort of collaborated when you wrestled them? I always went to them and asked, hey, what do you want to do? Because if, if I could get an idea of what they wanted to do, then I knew what kind of counters I could do and what I was doing. Cause I, I wouldn't know what to do, how to even begin to set up a pro wrestling match at that level. So they had to set it up. And then I had to, whatever they were going to do, whatever my spots were from there was to tell them what I was going to do from there. Uh, and then they just would have to trust me, which came, you know, probably about maybe uh, six months. in. I think people started to understand, you know, it's okay. I'm going to get you in things you don't understand. I'm not going to hurt you. Of uh, the established stars I've named and maybe a couple of extra that you want to mention, uh, who, let's say, who was the best at putting a match together? Uh, yeah, you know, um, I was with Shawn Michaels. I was with The Undertaker, Stone Cold, Bret Hart. I mean, all those guys. And, you know, The Rock. I uh, was with The Rock, and he's, as young as we were putting matches together, uh, it was great, right? But I'm telling you, it's it's not about who was better because it was just different types of styles that, you know, Sean was much different than Stone Cold, you know. Uh, Undertaker was much different than both of them, right? So it was just about really having an understanding of how they were putting those matches together and what I could do with them. So that's really what the challenge was because it, uh, but all those guys were great. I mean, like, they were mega stars. So it was more about me being able to match with their styles, being able to counter their styles. Did you enjoy it? Did you enjoy the process of putting a match together? Because it's almost like putting a jigsaw piece together, but you can do it any way you want sort of thing. It was fun because, like, with The Undertaker, we weren't going to be rolling on the ground, like, in and out of holds and false finishes. And it was going to be more methodical, you know. So I remember even with him where he was going to choke slam me. He goes, what can you do? You know, if I go to do that, I said, I'll just arm bar you. And he's like, a oh, good idea. Like, because he understood MMA. I was like, I can arm bar you. you just go up, give me a choke sign, I'll arm bar you. And, uh, and so that was the first time that was ever done uh, into an arm bar from a choke slam. And so, you know, just stuff like that. Same with Stone Cold, where he would get in stuff. He says, Hey, what can you do from here? Um, and so I would say, Well, I could do a, a sunset flip into an ankle lock. And he's like, How do you do that? Like, how do you go from there to there? And I was like, and so I just said, I, mo you know, like with most of them, I said, I'll, I don't worry about it. You just get there and I will get where I need to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we did. And they have matches with those guys, as you see in those matches, they were all good. Um, and it was really not with them, really not understanding where I was going to go from those moves, but just trusting that I would get there. Yeah. OK, so we're back then. Slight break. And uh, Owen Hart, we were going to we talked about Owen Hart a bit earlier. But I've got to ask you, so you uh, have a few of them for a few months. You do a couple of special matches. You know, you do the uh, dungeon match with Dan Seven as referee. And, of course, you do the Lion's Den match, which, for people who don't know, it was sort of a, a quasi-UFC kind of thing in the WWF mold. Who came up with the idea for the shape of the cage? 
Yeah, it, yeah, I know they came to me with a lot of the options of it, and I came up with the the slant because I felt like if we were going to do it in a cage fenced area, we need to be able to work off of it. And the only way we could do that is by having a slant to it to be able to go up the sides a little bit, but yet still have it up high enough to where it looked like the octagon. Um, and uh, so, and then of course the weapons, I remember coming up with the idea of being able to put weapons around the top of it uh, where you could reach it. We could fight and try and keep people from limit. You know, it was just a lot of, uh, of great um, abilities to be able to work a match in there um, without having to bounce off the ropes, but you know, just like with Owen did, or, uh, uh, you know, where he was able to jump off the, <laughs> off the side of the fence and, you know, and be able to hit me with something. And so it was just real creative to be able to, to take a cage like that and be able to use it for a pro wrestling match. Who's, um, uh, sorry, I'll forget that. I'll, I'll, I'll re-say it is how many times would somebody come to you with his latest version of the concept? What do you think? And then you'd add changes or did you basically have one meeting, give your opinion and then it turned up? Not sure what you mean on that. Sorry, uh, as far as the construction of the lion's den cage itself, did we were people constantly asking your opinion to develop it, or did you just have one meeting and then the lion's den cage turns up fully formed? No, there were several uh, things that they brought and showed, and talked about because that was a big deal, right? I mean, it's that was that was who I was. That's where I was at. So to be able to have input on that for them to involve me was I was very happy because. If they would have just come up with it, they'd have come up with the straight fence, and that would have been really difficult to work off of that. So being able to, you know, add that slant in there, um, even be able to add that platform above, which we never really used, I don't think, is coming off the top of it, but we could have. Um, but it was just, like I said, it was just being able to build something that I felt like we could add more to an actual cage match. And that was really the concept of going into a lot of that was more towards wrestling not as an MMA fight. There was got to be other uh, uh, opportunities for us to use, like the weapons at the top, being able to crawl up there and get them, being able to jump off those fences because they were angled a little bit. So you were able to get up there and get off of them better. So it was, it was, and being able to actually roll into those, being able to lay, being able to, you know, put people into, into there and being able to fight while you're still in the defense. Um, so there was, like I said, it was a, they come to me several times with those different ideas. And so um, I'm glad that we did it that way too, because man, I'm telling you, it would have been really difficult with just a regular straight up fence. Uh, what happened to the cage itself? Did you ever try and get it for your gym at the time or whatever happened to the lion's den? I don't know, but it seems to me like they're starting to do those kinds of matches again. Like there's WWF's bringing those things back or what is it? WCW now or w no, no, WWE. WWE. E, WWE. So they're starting to, to bring those type of um, hybrid wrestling matches in now. So it's exciting. I, I like it. I think it's where people, I think it's where people want it to go. And right. So when I watched it and, and the SummerSlam 98 one with Owen versus you, that, that mat, that canvas looked like it had no give whatsoever. It looked like it killed you every time you slammed onto <laughs> it. Is that true or? Yeah, it didn't bother me much. But for someone that was used to a, you know, a ring that flexed a little bit, I could only imagine how it would feel to them it not moving. But for me, because I fought on it for so long and I've been slammed on it and, you know, worked off of it, it just, it was, it was, it was normal for me. So um, for them, yeah, I can almost imagine it's like, wait, this does, there's no give. <laughs> I can easily imagine someone landing on that and just shitting the pants. Just, just you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Don't eat a lot of yogurt before you go out there. <laughs> and, who, and this sort of like plays into it is uh, you had several Lions Den matches. What did you think? I'm sure you were fine with it. But what did you think the time someone came up to you and said, guess who's beating you in a Lions Den match? Vince McMahon. Yeah. It's, you know, all that mattered to me was that I was in there with Vince. You know, that was definitely a big deal for me. You know, winning and losing wasn't even on my mind. Of It didn't matter, right? I was in with Vince McMahon. Was, um, I, I mean, uh, maybe it's hard to gauge, I don't know, but how big a fan of Vince, uh, sorry, how big a fan of uh, you was Vince? Vince, I thought, was a huge fan um, because, not, and I think he became a bigger fan after he kind of saw me work. 
um, because you, you could be a fan of something and really love somebody and they go in there and they just, you know, they're horrible. You still love them. You still love them as a, but you know, they're not for you. It's not going to work. So it goes down a little bit, but with me and Vince, I think once he saw what I could do, I think he became even a much, much more supporter for me, you know, in pro wrestling. So, uh, I, I, you know, being able to stand in that cage and look at Vince, uh, it was, it was, it was a rush. It was an honor. <laughs> I know you didn't really wrestle him too much, but did you ever, uh, uh, cause it was so long ago. I can't remember. No, did just stand in front of the guy being on the same TV as him, being able to dialogue with him. That was it. That was but, cool. That, well, I was wondering, I was wondering if you ever actually got to wrestle him, throw a few moves on him because I believe he's apart from like maybe possibly the most uncoordinated person in WWE history. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, with me, it didn't matter because, remember, I put people where I want them, and whether they want to or not. So it, it wouldn't have mattered to me. We would have been okay. But um, like I said, it was just great that I was on camera and I had something, uh, some sort of an angle with him. It was awesome. Did you ever spend any, like, uh, out of the out of office hours time with him, you know, just have a drink with him? What kind of guy was he like outside the ring? Yeah, I never got that opportunity. Um, I only got to meet with him on different business um adventures or ideas and stuff like that so i i really never really got to know him outside of that uh we're going to go to early 1999 now you feud with billy gunn and it sort of starts off where your uh on-screen sister ryan shamrock is it alicia webb was a real name wasn't it yes right? yeah. yeah and uh i, I can't remember if it was a... no i'm sorry I, i've totally messed something up there but i'm gonna ask it anyway is uh billy gunn at this point is starting starting to get a singles run at this point was it ever told to you that you need to get Billy prepared for the main event? Um, I don't recall. I couldn't recall. It was a while back. Me and Billy were hung out quite a bit together, along with Road Dog and Alicia. Um, we all hung out quite a bit. So uh, there's there's a lot of stuff that was talked about. So okay, then um, there's, there's something I actually want to bring up because I totally. I messed up two questions and put them together. There was a pay per view uh, February uh, Valentine's Day massacre. Anyway, you're facing Val Venus. And there's a bit on the outside where somehow I watched this tape a thousand times and only on the thousandth time I noticed it. You're out on the outside. Uh, Alicia's outside as well, and I believe uh, she's with Val. And um, she forgets what she's doing. She forgets the next thing that she's supposed to do. And you yell really loudly, Slap me! <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, you... Man, you just, I've probably told the story anyway, but tell the story again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, that was true. Um, she just, I don't know what happened. I just like, because we couldn't go on unless she slapped me. I was like, that was the spot. You got to do that. <laughs> Otherwise, we can't tell the story. <laughs> What, uh, oh, that was so funny. I just remember, I, but I didn't see it for the first 999 times. And now you can't yeah. unsee it when you see it. It's amazing. But I just love it when he just goes, slap me. And then she goes, smack you. And then you do the best <gasps> face as well. It's so fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I I remember that. It's like you forget a lot of things and someone said, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear, I'm so glad I, I'm so glad I got to tell you that because that's something that was ingrained in my mind. Um, we're going to go a bit further ahead, and this is your last few uh, months in WWF. Uh, in Jim Ross's book, he describes your last few months with the company as being you're starting to get a bit unha oh, sorry a bit unhappy, and uh, th towards the end you start missing a couple of shows, and basically your heart's not really in it anymore. Uh, when did what sort of caused that? When did your heart stop being in it? Was it just the daily grind, or was it something else? Yeah, I think it was a combination of a lot, but I think what started it was the screw job with Bret Hart. I think that, you know, for me, wrestling was about trust, you know, um, especially being in a wrestling ring where you're, you're literally giving your body to people. And I was sold when I got there by everybody that you have to work with one another. And if you don't, then you, you're not going to be here. You, you have to work with each other. And you're going to have to be able to do jobs. It's just that's part of it, right? You, know, you win, and you, there's different things that are going to happen, and you got to be good with it. You got to be okay with it. Your your idea is about putting on a great match, and nothing more. Putting on a great match and getting over whatever storyline you have to get over. And and I I bought into that. That's what I bought into. Like I trusted that. And then when that screw job happened with Brett, 
it was like everything that I was preached to that I was supposed to honor and trust was gone because it came from the top, it came from the top that this is how they were going to take the strap off of Brett because Brett didn't want to give it up. And it just didn't make sense to me. Like, so when someone disagrees, you're going to go in and you're going to possibly put them in a position to get hurt because in our business or in that business, when somebody's not where they're supposed to be, people could get paralyzed or killed. We've seen it when things go wrong. And so for me at that point in time, it was like, what about me? Like, I'm a part of Brett's crew. Like, where do I fit in now? Like, what's going to happen here? Uh, is there distrust with me because I'm a part of that crew? Um, and so that's where things got shifty for me. And I don't know if I necessarily lost heart, but it was almost like it was, I felt like it was time for me to go. Like, maybe I need to go back to what I was doing in MMA and, and go back there because it felt like I lost my support. I don't, and this is just my feeling. I'm not saying that's what happened, but it just felt like I lost my support. You know, um, that, that whole clan there with the Bret Hart and everything under them. There was a lot of support there. There was a Shawn Michaels and a lot of support there uh, with their group. And, and not that I dislike anybody, but that's what I fell under uh, because I worked with Bret, right? It wasn't a choice. It was something that was said that I had to go do and work with Bret and work some things. That I did. So I was put under that group. That's where I was put. I wasn't put under Shawn Michaels and not that I would have said no, because I love Shawn Michaels. I think he's great, but this is just where I was at. And then when I ended up there and then this thing with Brett and Owen, it was like, it was like, uh, I just didn't feel like I had a place anymore. Like now I was the underdog. And so I, I think JR got it right, you know, losing heart, but it wasn't because I didn't want to wrestle. It was because I felt like I didn't have support there anymore. Well, uh, after, because this was in late 97, Montreal, and then you'd go ahead, you'd feud with The Rock. You'd, pr you'd have your greatest year, I think is easy to say, in 1998. And then in early, 90, uh, this is probably mid-1999, so a good 18 months after the screw job. And then once again, uh, maybe partly was injuries as well, because I know you've said before that you... Well, yeah, but you got to uh, remember, remember all this happened. I was starting to move up. Yeah. I was starting to go, right? And then The Rock, me and Rock did our thing. Uh they moved him up, and then all of a sudden, I'm asked to do a job to China. I'm asked to do a job to, um, you know, who else was it? Um, I was asked to do a match with China and do that, and then there was somebody else. I couldn't remember what it was. Oh, I was supposed to have incest with my sister, uh, which was Ryan. Right. Um, <laughs> they wanted me to do these different angles, and this was after I started to make that run, even after all the stuff with bread stuff, and I still had those concerns. Don't get me wrong. I was still still even going through that, but at least I was in the direction that I was supposed to be going, but then all of a sudden, I hit this wall after that, and it was almost like I was going backwards, and that's when all that stuff creeped in. It was like, I don't feel like I've got support here anymore. There's no one for me to go to to figure out what's going on. Um, because it doesn't feel right. Like I don't feel like I'm getting the push or in the move in the direction that I came in with. I remember I built my career. I came into WWF already a made person. And now all of a sudden they were pushing me in the right direction. And all of a sudden after rock went up and then they started to have me do these other weird things. Then there was nobody there. Like Owen was gone. Brett was gone. You know, there was, there was really no foundation for me to go, Hey, what are they doing? Like, why is this happening? Like, this does not, this not me. Like, having incest with my sister, the world's most dangerous man. What? Like, wrestling China? Like, what does that do for me? Like, and so that's where all that came in. It, it didn't happen like, oh, all of a sudden, break up. now all of a sudden everybody's against me. No, it was a, it was a process of things that were happening uh, that put me in that position to go, this is just not for me. Like, they're not moving in a direction that, uh, is going to benefit what I have already created, that I've already built. I also would like to bring up that you said uh, pro wrestling, you've got more injured in pro wrestling than you ever did in mixed martial arts. And I also read that you had a pretty severe neck injury, but I don't know where that happened from. So uh, what happened with the neck? Oh, so I broke my neck when I was 17 years old. Right. How do you do that? Uh, amateur collegiate wrestling. Um, I broke my neck. I had a bone chip taken out of my hip. It was fused in my uh, vertebrae in my neck and my third uh, vertebrae. Um, 
it was a, a fusion. So my, my, uh, my, I didn't have a whole lot of, of thing. I was told I never play contact sports again. Although we know that's not true. I did. <laughs> um, but I had issues. And then of course it happened again in 2011. I believe I had brackets put in, in my lower back from one to three in my lower back. And from, I believe one to seven in my neck, which is brackets, steel brackets. Yeah. So um, I had all that stuff done. So I had, uh, you know, when people hear about that story, they're like, that's crazy. You broke your neck and you went on and became a, a UFC champion, a Pankers champion, a WWF champion. It's like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's just how it is. What other uh, injuries specifically did you get from pro wrestling that maybe people don't know? Um, I, I would say that, like, for instance, when I did this thing with um, Mark Henry, we were outside the ring and I remember pushing on him. And as I went to push on him, I went to pivot. And my foot was stuck in the mat and I literally snapped it. I broke it. Um, that's where the, the chair thing came in with Owen breaking my leg because I already had a cast. I was already broke. So we just put in a cast after that so that there was an angle to it. So um, that was for real. I literally did break my ankle just not on the chair. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's when um, That's when Owen turns heel again, isn't it? Yeah. And it's the tag match. I remember exactly what it is. Uh, yeah. I'm going to ask you a couple more things. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm going to cough into the mic as well a couple more times. Excuse me. Um, in hindsight, with the injuries, would you have ridden out your MMA career when you started it and not gone back into pro wrestling? Or maybe would you have stayed in pro wrestling longer if you could go back? I don't, I, I don't understand. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, right, so let's say back in 1999, um, you've got a load of injuries from pro wrestling. At that time in 1999, would, did you wish that you'd never gone back into pro wrestling because you got injured so much? No, 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 no. I didn't. I wasn't plagued with injuries. I got injured mm. uh, more more than I would have if I was in MMA, no question. But it wasn't injuries that stopped me from performing. Um, no, not at all. Um, obviously, when I went back into the MMA, those injuries were were bothersome in training no question but in pro wrestling no it, it wouldn't have wouldn't have mattered right but um wrestling is is brutal people don't realize that in fighting i could go and beat somebody i don't have to, i could go in and beat them in a minute two minutes whatever that causes but in wrestling you've got a certain amount of time and you got bumps that you have to take whether you want to or not though it's just part of the program and every so day as well you, yes you just you go for seven days and you're bumping four days um, and you go home for two days or three days, you rest, you go back out and you do it again. So it's a constant, you know, punishment on the body, uh, may not be a huge impact, you know, or anything like that. But if you do that for a year, that's a lot, a lot of pounding. I am going to take us now to the finale of the podcast. It's sort of like the name association. It's another game, but instead I'm going to give you a name of somebody you wrestled. It could be from any point in your pro wrestling career. And this will take us to the end of the show. And then I will thank you so much for your time and a great interview. And the first person I'm going to mention to you is the Blue Meanie. Oh, pass. He whacked you with a chair really hard one time. <laughs> That's about it. I don't remember. I mean... I've been here with chairs, man. They don't bother me. I don't – never have. That's fine. Uh, the next one is Road Dog. Oh, fun, fun, fun <laughs> guy. Yes. Any uh, – I mean, when you've got a big smile on your face and say fun guy, it sort of leads me to believe there's no stories you can tell. No, there's not. <laughs> 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 but, hey, I'm telling you what, man. The guy's got your back. He's a good dude. I love him. Good man. You weren't there, right? This is totally off my head. You weren't there when Billy Gunn and Tonya Harding had that dust up, were you? No. Oh, damn. I'm going to have to find out the story on that. Anyway, I'll move on. Bruce Pritchard. Clever. Clever. I like that guy. You know, uh, I never, I mean, even though he was around a lot and I got to talk to him, I never really got involved with him. But man, I some of the stories and stuff that, um, I hear um, in the earlier days with him, man, he had some great ideas. And and I also talked to him on a podcast, or not talked to him, but listened to his podcast, man, and I really love his podcast, man. They do a great job. Uh, Dr. Tom Pritchard. I don't know if you had too much interaction with Tom. Yeah, I never really got to, to, to work with him much. Uh, Earl Hebner. Uh, 
he's a funny, uh, um, he's another one of those funny guys, right? You, and you wanted him as your referee. He was, a, he was a very, very, when he was out there, he did his job. I felt bad for him for the position he was put in with Brett and Sean. Who was your favorite referee? Was it Earl or did you have a list Earl. of favorites? Earl. There was a lot of good ones. Tim. Tim was good. Um, but it was a lot of good ones. But Earl was was the face. Yeah. You know, I really enjoyed working with him. Uh, uh, the Daily Departs him as well. He passed away recently. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, Terry Runnels. Disappointing. Very disappointing. Um, I just it, it felt like she had so much, so much more and they just never got a chance to. Never really got a chance to. Just talent, talking? Talent. I mean, just and, and and again, I thought when you talked to her behind stage, she was smart. Like she wasn't a dumb girl. And just don't feel like they used her the right way. Like she she had a lot more talent rather than just being a body. It felt like she could have done more. Next one's Brian Christopher. <laughs> He's <laughs> short man's complex. <laughs> He's always walking around trying to be six seven, you know. <laughs> he wanted to make sure everybody noticed who he was. Uh, but fun guy, another guy that's just really good to be around, you know. I love that guy. He was he's he was always a like whenever you were in a room, you knew he was there. Like he was always ribbon or, or having a, something happen. It was loud. Um and I think it had a lot to do with because he was short. He wanted to make sure everybody knew who he was. I am in the room. Don't overlook me. <laughs> <laughs> I am um, in the previous interview. I think it might have been um, Chaz had banged a mosh and I said Brian Christopher. And he said he had an interesting relationship with Bradshaw. Oh, I, I yes. Yeah, I don't know that one. That one's a behind the scenes one oh. that I wasn't into. I wasn't into. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was hoping for the story on that, but never mind. Uh, Ahmed yeah. Johnson. Oh, man. Um, I didn't get to know him much, but the time that I was there, from, my, uh, from the things that I heard, he was just hard to work with. I, I believe uh, injurious. He, uh, he had a propensity to injure himself and everybody else. He was just, I think he was too focused on being big and being this monster rather than um, understanding it's not real. Like, this is not you. Like, this is a character, and your character needs to take care of the people you're working with. Insane Clown Posse. Ah, uh, man. Um, don't know much about it. Really don't. Even though I, I was there, I just I just wasn't around it. No, that's fine. Uh, Val Venus. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think me and Val hit it off wrong at first. I think a lot of it had to do with, you know, maybe it was storylines or something, but we never really kind of clicked in anything. Like, even though we were put together on some things, it just didn't feel like it was there. Like there was, wasn't chemistry. Um, but now um, I would say that uh, he's an expert in cannabis. <laughs> <laughs> Man, ain't that the truth? I just I interviewed him a few weeks ago. I think you're so on the money with that one. Uh, the next yeah. one's uh, in a wrestling sense, Josh Barnett. Man, what a you know he's the kind of guy you look at, you think nothing of him, and next thing you know, you're waking up in the hospital. <laughs> he's just one of those kind of guys you look at. He's a nice guy, he presents himself well, but you piss him off, man. He's a beast. How did your match go in New Japan with him? Loved it, man. I thought we had great chemistry. Uh, it, you know, that was, a, remember, we talked about the hybrid wrestling over in yeah. Japan. If me and him would have gotten together, we would have had a great, great program. We would we would have been rivals. Next one, Bob Holly. Um, I loved his, I loved, I loved the way he was able, Mr. Head, right? That's Al Snow. Oh, okay. So Bob Holly was, he was the buzz cut blonde hair. Um, jacked up, dude. I can move on. Yeah, move on because I, I, I think I know him, and in fact, he's in tremendous shape even today, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and I worked. I think we were in all, all Australia together, I believe, or something like that. And he was still in great shape. I'll, uh, I'll ask you another name, then I'll, I'll Google a photo for him. Uh, oh, I've already said Robert Fuller. Uh, you wrestled. I didn't realize this. Shinsuke Nakamura. Yeah, that was what that was actually in uh, um, new, um, UWF, wasn't it? That's a great question. It was in the early two thousands. It it may have been an yeah. Anoki thing. I don't know. 
Yeah, I don't remember. I mean, I, 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 he wore the, was he wore the pants, right? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Yes. Long hair, yeah. little, little goatee thing. Yeah, I don't remember much about that. Okay. Uh, that's Bob Holly. Yes, that's him. That's right. Yeah. Tremendous shape, man. The guy's a great worker. He's one of those guys that you look at and you go, man, this dude has aged well. <laughs> Next one. And I don't know how many people know this is that you wrestled him quite a lot, Chris Chavez, Tatanka. Tatanka, Chris Chavez, man. I talked to him through social media. His son is a stud in collegiate wrestling. He's really, really good. Um, but yeah, Chris is one of those guys where, and you want to talk about the beginnings. When I was Vince Torelli, we worked against each other quite a bit. I got a story. When we went into one of his nations uh, and we were on the res, um, <laughs> they came to me and told me that uh, I was going to um, go over on Chris. And then, of course, it was a rib because we were going to put Chris over in there because they told me before we got there that if, if I beat him, that I won't make it off the res. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, which is in those days was probably true. And so I said, yeah, no problem, man. He can have it. <laughs> so we get there and they say, Hey man, we're going to change it up. We're going to, you're going to go over on Chris, but we got to have to make sure when you go over, we're going to have all these security guys get around you because there's death threats. And I'm like, why are we changing it? <laughs> never know. You never knew a wrestler going, yeah, I'll give my strap up. <laughs> it was like, come on, you guys stop it, man. You know, there's no way I'm, I'm going over on him. <laughs> was he doing like the full native American thing even back then, you know, with the headdress and everything, or was he, was he in full kit or was he just like more plain? No, he, he did, but not quite as, as much. I think, you know, obviously all of us at that time were trying to make enough money just to pay for gas and food. Mm. So he wasn't able to really get all blown up, but um, there was times where he did wore the headdress. And I think that night when we worked, I think he did in the nation. I'm not positive, but um, yeah. So it, it, he was a, um, a tremendous talent. Yeah. I mean, obviously he went up to the WWF before I did, Um so and when he left, man, it was him and the Nasty Boys, I believe, went at the same time, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and they they went off and had a great career. I know Tatanka had a really good career there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've got about five minutes left. I'm going to give you a few more names. We'll do some plugs now. Well, thank you so much for a great interview. And who am I going to ask you? Sable. Sorry? Sable, Rena, Rena Mero. Oh, beautiful. Um, didn't... I, I mean, she said hi a couple of times, but I never really got to know her, but she seemed like she was very, um, very professional. And, you know, in most cases with women, um, you know, they don't under, even understand what it is that they're doing at times that walk around with, you know, dresses on and heels, but she seemed to be, have a pretty good idea of a character and who she was supposed to be. So, and like I said, I didn't really get to know her a whole lot, but uh, I appreciated her because she never really gotten away or made any trouble brian pillman uh, yeah it was, that's a hard one right because i remember i rode with him um and i i was driving my first time there and uh if i felt bad for him because it was almost like you know he needed help but there was nobody there to help him uh we went into a waffle house and i remember we went in to go eat and he was drinking these cokes in the car and he drank like four of them like within a half hour of us going to this waffle house where everybody was going stone cold some of the seamstress everybody was going there and by the time we got there within 30 minutes brian couldn't hardly talk and he was drinking cloaks and i'm thinking what's wrong with him so we he goes in with me and i'm kind of helping him in and we sit down and uh and he's like he's passing out and I remembered, and Stone Cold was laughing, and the seamstress were laughing. And I'm looking at him going, dude, there's something wrong. Should we call somebody? And they're like, dude, just put him in the car. And I was like, are you sure? Do I take him to the hospital? He goes, don't take him to the hospital. And I, I was green. Like, I had no clue. And what had happened was that, you know, he ended up, you know, taking, because Brian was hurting. I mean, he had pain. Um, you know, he had some injuries, severe yeah. injuries. Ankle. His ankle was shattered, I believe, yeah. Yeah, so he was limping all the time, so he got caught up on these somas where it was, you know, muscle relaxers, painkillers to help with the pain. And um, I think that he got caught on those. And and uh, it, it was sad because that's my only memory, uh, really, of him because I, it's the only personal contact I had was when I was driving with him for a while. But um, then there was a point in time where I was like, man, I, I don't want this responsibility. 
um, and I had to get out. So, but when I hear the name, my heart hurts because, you know, you just hate to see people have to be there and not get the help they need. Yeah. And a tremendous talent as well. The, that was a, never got to yes. quite flourish, which is such a shame. Uh, Road Warrior Hawk or the Road Warriors in general. Yeah, man, I, you think about the first thing you think about is explosive. I mean, just the crowd noise, the biggest pops ever uh, were the Road Warriors. The characters themselves were just so, you were so attachable because you've seen the movies and the, these guys running around motorcycles and, you know, just the characters that they presented. And then for them to go out there and put on the matches, the strong guys and all that stuff. So it was tremendous. I know great. Great that I was able to get to know them because I got to know those guys and, and really be around them. And I thought um, that, you know, Animal um, was, you know, a tremendous guy for Hawk. I thought Animal kept Hawk balanced. Um, and at the end of his life, Hawk put himself in a place uh, that uh, I believe that was normalcy. He got himself back to where he needed to be um, and not taking crazy risks anymore. Uh, and unfortunately, that's the time he passed away. Yeah, the damage was done. Uh, I'll try and ask a couple, uh, a couple of uh, sort of lighter ones. Michael Hayes. I didn't know him. Sonny. Yeah, disappointing. Another story you think about was tremendous beauty, uh, smart. I thought, um, but then just took that wrong road. Things didn't work out for her, um, and she she made bad choices, man. Really bad choices. And the final name I'll give you is Steven Seagal. Because why not? <laughs> yeah, he talks a lot. That's for sure. You know. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't know him, so I really don't know what to say other than what I see in social media, which is not enough. But it just seems like there's a lot of this trying to be tough, but with never really seeing him do it. Like, to me, that's... What I see him trying to say, I train these fighters and they're going to go out and win. And, and, and I did this to this guy, but, but you never did it. Like you never put yourself in that position to go fight anybody to say that you're that guy. And also he's got a giant wig. So it's sort of hard to sort of take him seriously when he's got that giant forestation job on, <laughs> on his head. He's like, yeah, that was the other guy. <laughs> that wasn't you. <laughs> Listen, Ken, I want to thank you so much for spending so much time with me. It's been an absolute joy. I've been looking forward to this for quite a while as well. So uh, before I thank you again for your time, do you want to get some more plugs out? I know the Bare Knuckle Fighting uh, wants to Yeah, just, uh, just what we got going on is Valor Bare Knuckle. Um, we got a watch party January 7th. We're going to be relaunching. Um, and uh, so we'll we'll definitely fill everybody in January 7th, but we're coming. There you go. Are you coming to England at any point? Maybe. Yes, we're, we definitely had talks. Well, if, uh, if you're going to be in Manchester, that's where I live. So if you're around here sometime, I'll definitely come and see you. Love to, brother. Love nice to. Nice one. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you next week.